This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thanks for coming. It's my pleasure to welcome Tom Barbash to Story Hour. Tom grew up on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, and he was working as a newspaper reporter in Syracuse when he began taking classes at the graduate MFA workshop at Syracuse University. Uh, and from there, he went on to the Iowa Writers' Workshop and was then awarded a Stegner at uh, Stanford and also a Mishner Fellowship. Uh, in 2002, Tom published his first novel, The Last Good Chance, which is set in Lakeland, a small decaying town in upstate New York. A high-flying urban planner returns to this, his hometown with dreams of economic and social revival through an ambitious lakefront development program. What awaits him is small town politics and prejudice and tubs of toxic material that have been dumped into the lake surreptitiously. Um, Publishers Weekly wrote, I quote, Barbash shows himself to be a knowing guide to small town politics in a first novel with extraordinary empathic reach. This is a taut, intricate vision of ambition, corruption, and love in the post-industrial era. In 2003, Tom published On Top of the World, a non-fiction account of the shattering effects of the 9-11 uh, World Trade Center attack on one brokerage firm, Cantor Fitzgerald. Uh, this company has its offices on one of the upper floors of Tower One, and it lost 658 employees that morning. The book traces the company's attempts to stay in business and help its employees' families through the story of its CEO, Tom Lutnick, who happens to be a college friend of Tom's. The New York Newsday reviewer wrote that the book was a sensitive and heartbreaking account with enormous emotional power. Um, and last year, Tom published Stay Up With Me, a collection of 13 short stories in which the characters struggle with various incarnations of loss. One of my favorites from the collection is Balloon Night, which begins, Timkin's wife left him during a blisteringly cold Thanksgiving week, two nights before their annual balloon night party. Timkin, uh, as we see later in the story, is too depressed to tell anyone this, so he tries to make it through the party by pretending that his wife is away on a sudden business trip. The story that grows out of Timkin's attempt to muddle through is somehow simultaneously heartbreaking and funny. In The Independent, Max Liu observed that if masterful new books signal that the short story is in rude health, then Tom Barbash flexes the form's fettle to obscene levels of fineness uh, in his debut collection. I absolutely agree with that, and you should read this book. Uh, Tom lives in Marin County and teaches in the MFA program uh, at the California College of the Arts. Please join me in welcoming Tom Barbash to Story Hour. Thank you, Vikram. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and actually, it's the first reading, although he's not going to stay for the whole thing that my son has attended. He's there, so it's over there. <laughs> to whom the, the, the book is dedicated to, so yeah. But, um, but it's, it's now it's time to, to the, the subject matter will not be, it'll bore you, James, so. <laughs> See you soon. Um, so I, I was here for Walter Kern's reading, and uh, this was last year, um, and I'm so excited to be invited back because I just looked at this room, and it's such a magnificent room. It just, I would like to just sit here and read and think, and I should, I should just, I guess it's open to, to those of us who want to do that, right, on a regular basis. So yeah, I will definitely return. Um, so what I thought I'd do is, is um, I'd read a story and then open it up to discussions of anything you guys want, you know, about if you want to talk about the, the nonfiction book or novel writing or stories or, uh, you know, anything. Um, I'd love to talk. And um, so I was trying to decide what I was going to read when I came here. And I thought I'd read the last story. It's called The Women. And it's, you know, it, it takes place around this time of year. 
and um, I don't read it very often, so or haven't, um, and I thought this would be a good place to read it. So, um, the women. A week after my mother died, my father and I went to a series of holiday parties. We lived in a 16th floor apartment just off Central Park West, and in our building alone, there were four different gatherings at which you could see my father surrounded by an infield of swooning women. He had become, in the wake of my mother's death, desirable real estate, a handsome 58-year-old with money. He was testing the waters, and you could see it bringing him back to life. One of the women he met took him to her personal trainer. Another took him clothes shopping to stores like Kenneth Cole and Hugo Boss to, quote, raise his spirits. He returned home weirdly pleased with himself as though he'd regained fluency in a language he hadn't studied since high school. I'd borrow a new leather jacket of my father's when I went out for the night, and I'd find business cards in the pockets or a napkin with a phone number. Before long, the women were dropping by our house, and I'd see them late at night drinking coffee in my mother's kitchen, moving in and out of our bathroom or my parents' bedroom, where they'd often stay over. There'd be a scarf or a purse left out on a chair. I'd hear a woman whispering as she snuck out for my sake early before seven. My room was next to the front entryway, and I was having trouble sleeping in those days. For the first few weeks of February, my father dated a chatty, frizzy-haired woman named Leanne who worked at the mayor's office scheduling press conferences and talking to reporters. They ordered in Chinese food, and they'd leave the half-empty containers lying out on the counter. They watched movies in his room, and then at some point, his door would close. I pretended a few times that it was my mother in there, that she'd slipped in without my knowing, but usually I put my earbuds in to keep from hearing anything. One night toward the end of that month, he brought home a woman from Los Angeles named Chloe, who owned a string of boutiques and wore a sparkly eyeliner, low-waisted jeans, and a belly button ring in winter. She flirted with me when he left the room, quizzing me about my personal life and once touching my knee. She gave me her business card, which listed the address of her New York store. Come by sometime, she said, with a predatory softness in her eyes. When my father walked back in, there was music I knew he hated booming from the study. This OK, he asked. Oh, Steve, Chloe said, we can do better than that. She went and turned the tuner to some kind of lame diva dance music. She started grooving on her way back. She was about 40, I'd say, but she tossed her hair and gyrated like an extra on a music video. My father glanced at me and raised his eyebrows. I wrote absurd on a piece of notepaper and flashed it quickly so she wouldn't see. Both of you come here and dance, she said from the living room. She looked misplaced, vamping next to the long oak dining table and under my grandmother's crystal chandelier. My father moved his shoulders tentatively to the beat. Chloe yelled, show your father how to dance, Andy. He does just fine for himself, I told her. I went and hid in my room. When I ventured out an hour later, his door was closed, and I saw her satin jacket and a shiny red purse draped over the reading chair in the living room. Later that same week, I watched my father pick up the widow of one of his business partners during the intermission of Into the Woods. They were sharing notes about the New York City Ballet, and she said she had no one to go with. Did he know anyone with extra tickets? She came back with us for drinks after the show, and my father put on an old Billie Holiday record my mother had loved. The widow's name was Patricia Hobson. She was an interior decorator and good-looking in a preppy, older woman way, with attentive eyes, a long, thin nose, and a long, wiry neck. I kept staring at the cords on her neck as she spoke. New York is a fabulous place to be a boy just out of college, she said. How so? Well, the ratio is entirely in your favor. There's so many gorgeous, stylish women in the city. I see them absolutely everywhere, and they're all single. My lord, Andrew, they'll eat you up. What's your type? I shrugged. He likes the tall ones, my father said, because my last girlfriend had been my height. Well, my daughter is 5'5", five five, but she can wear heels, she said. I'm pretty sure I'd be a disappointment, I told her, and she glanced over at my dad and smiled kindly. I doubt that very much, she said. She started to size up our apartment then, commenting on the arrangements of the chairs and sofas and the artwork on our walls. The apartment has so much potential, she said. Give me a few hours some Saturday, af some Saturday afternoon and I'll show you what we can do. Let me show you something, my father said. He poured her a scotch and they stepped out on the terrace to look at the lights across Central Park. Oh boy, she said, which was what everyone said when they saw our view. This is my favorite spot in the world. If you look through the binoculars, you can see people jogging around the reservoir. I run around that reservoir four days a week, Mrs. Hobson said. Let us know next time so we can watch for you, my father said. I thought he was joking until I saw his face. 
I will, she said. We can wave to each other. I slipped out later to get drunk with my high school friend Jonas, but the whole time I was picturing my father and Mrs. Hobson ransacking our underachieving apartment, taking our keepsakes down to the storage locker in the basement of our building. There were legitimate grounds for my fear. In the last week, two framed photographs and four drawers of clothes had vanished. I think my father had wanted to disperse my mother's ghost discreetly and respectfully. But every couple of days, something else was missing. Most recently, a picture of my mother and godmother as teenagers resting on a hammock like lazy goddesses. In its place now is a blank spot on the wall. It's got to stop, I thought. Jonas tilted his head puzzled. I guess I'd said it aloud. He's not cheating on her, he said. But because she's dead, you mean. I suppose that's technically right. We chugged our beers, and then Jonas went to the bar to refill our empty pitcher. I have a friend who wants to meet you, he said when he returned. Actually, she's a little obsessed about it. What'd you tell her? This and that. You just come up in conversation, then it's all she wants to talk about. She must have an exciting life, I said. She does, actually. She's really smart, good looking. Jonas paused as though I'd asked a trick question. Sort of. She kind of hides it. She doesn't do much for me, but maybe she would if I didn't know her so well. You told her about my mother dying, I said. He nodded. When I told her, she cried. That's just too f***ing weird, I said. <laughs> I reached for my father's jacket, which was on the floor next to me, and rested on my lap. It wasn't. He put a cigarette out and lit another. Anyhow, get comfortable, brother. You're not getting anywhere near that apartment for another couple of hours, you got me? When we finally made it back, we saw her coat on a hanger in the vestibule. Jonas ran his hand across Mrs. Hobson's scarf and then bent over to smell it. Your dad is outstanding, he said. <laughs> I took a tin of sour candies from her coat pocket, just to do it, really, not just because I wanted anything of hers. Both my father and I were in therapy then. He went two mornings a week to an animated man named Bergman who had a book-lined office on the Upper East Side. And on Wednesday nights, I saw a woman named Dr. Hellendorf down in the village. Bergman and my father started meeting shortly after my mother was diagnosed as at my mother's urging. When my father left therapy, he seemed uplifted, which was far from the case with me. He and his therapist talked about my mother, probably, talked about my mother, probably, but they also talked about art and politics, even sports. Bergman was constantly finding his way into our breakfast or dinnertime conversations. Bergman thinks the Mets should trade Piazza, my father would say, or Bergman gave me a list of Polish films for us to rent. They were friends. I once saw them walking down our street together, which seemed like a violation of the patient-therapist relationship. I asked Dr. Hellendorf about it. I asked her if she would ever take a walk with a patient. She tilted her head slightly to the right. She wore a neutral pashmina that resembled the ones my mother wore. Is that something you think you would like to do? Take a walk with me? <laughs> no, I said too emphatically. I mean, not especially. She allowed a long, awkward silence. Why do you think you asked then? I didn't have an answer. I began to hear a buzzing sound like a halogen light turned too high or low. Do you think perhaps you're disappointed sometimes when the world doesn't respond to you the way it responds to your father? That's probably true, I said. I saw her write something down. But I don't want that kind of attention. Then why do you think it is that you're so angry? I'm not angry, I said. She didn't respond. She might have raised her eyebrows. I just don't get why he's so happy all the time. She continued to study me. I was fairly used to these standoffs. In the silence, the buzzing started up again. Do you hear that sound, I asked. She paused for a moment. What sort of sound? It was faint now and probably from somewhere on the street. I guess I don't either, I said. When my mother was sick, I was out of the house a lot. I'd go to work, an entry-level job I'd talk my way into at a public radio station, and then I'd stay out until everyone was asleep. Once, I stayed away for nearly two weeks without telling on any, anyone where I went. I missed her birthday party. When I reached my father on the phone, he was madder than he'd ever been. And then he forgave me, which was even worse. He said I was distraught, which was true. But for the longest time, I just felt numb. He said people cope in different ways. He said he thought of leaving all the time, which I believed and didn't care to hear. I couldn't really say why I needed to be away, and really, I was able to put my mother out of my mind most of the time. Dr. Hellendorf said I was repressing my reactions to my mother's illness and, quote, obfuscating my emotional responses. 
And she said that was a big reason why I stayed in the house all the time now. I was trying to keep my family intact by staying at home. I told her that was bullshit, if not in those words. I called my father to see if I should pick up dinner, and a woman answered the phone. Oh, fuck, I said and hung up. That's why I sent my son out of the room. <laughs> On my way into the building, I was spotted again by Mrs. Wiederman, a gaunt, red-haired woman who, like four or five others whose names I forgot, invited me to dinner every time she saw me. I made a pot of stew you can keep in the freezer and heat up for your suppers, she said. Actually, I should have whispered this. You can heat up for your supper, she said, whispering to protect my pride. We're eating out, mostly, I said. Well, I'll just leave it outside your door then, she said. Dishes and sealed Tupperware, aluminum pans, and plastic baggies had been dropped off on our doorstep ever since my mother died. You know, your mother would be so proud of you, she said as we rode the cramped and ancient elevator together. I thought about the arguments my mother and I had been having over my lack of direction. Why, I asked. She seemed confused by the question. Because you're a lovely young man, she said. She stepped toward me then, held my face in her cold, damp hands. I smelled mouthwash and old lady perfume. Then I felt the walls of the elevator shiver. She was actually going to kiss my face. Get away, I said, pulling back. Did you even know my mother? She gasped and then stared at me with her mouth open as if I was, as if I was dissolving before her eyes. Oh, she said, oh dear. When we got to her floor, she stumbled out of the elevator. And we don't need any more of your shitty dinners, I yelled. I felt pretty bad about this later. As we made our way across the park on a Saturday, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, my father told me I hadn't been myself lately. We were walking through the 79th Street fields by Belvedere Castle, and in the cold, our voices came out in vapor. I'm fine, I said, and you? I know you're not sleeping, he said. A man in a gray Columbia sweatshirt jogged by with a black Labrador keeping pace. It's getting better, I said, though it wasn't. Whenever I dropped off, I kept having a dream in which my mother was alive and the two of us had to go around convincing everyone we knew that she hadn't died. Prove it's you, they'd say. She'd tell them their middle name or their birthday, and they'd tell her she'd gotten them wrong. It's a strange time for everyone, my father said. We stopped on the path facing each other. I smoothed a patch of dirt and stones with my foot. The buzzing in my ears was constant now like the static on a radio station that only partially comes in, or a wiring defect on a speaker you might eventually get used to. It isn't my business, I said, but it might be easier if there weren't so many of them. You're right, he said and sighed. I need to slow down. What the hell? You're living, I said. He considered this for a moment. Then he put his arm around me like I was 12 again. In the track-lit lunchroom of the museum, my father was his old self again. He told me he chased how he chased my mother to Europe. He talked while a waiter with a white shirt and black bow tie poured us Heineken's, tipped the glass to keep down the foam, tipping the glass to keep down the foam. He met her on a Memorial Day weekend when she was a waitress on Martha's Vineyard, then met her again when she was checking coats at a party in New York. I'd heard this story so often I used to groan when he started, but not this time. I wanted him to slow down and tell every detail. She'd rented a house with your godmother in Nice, he said, a two-story cottage with a yard and a view of two churches and a bakery. I couldn't stand being apart from her, he said. I took my three weeks of vacation and flew to France. She didn't know what to make of me. We barely knew each other, and there I was on her doorstep in my shorts and T-shirt with a Michelin guide to Italy and Greece under my arm like a college kid. He took a sip of beer and cleared his throat. Two weeks later, in Venice, I proposed. She was probably the most beautiful woman I'd ever met, he said, and far and away the most perceptive. It's like she'd lived a thousand lives because of all the books she read. It sometimes made me uneasy. How come, I asked. Because I couldn't hide the way I could with other women. I could hear him breathing, heavy and slow. He held my glance and then put his glasses on his glasses and studied the check. You remind me of her sometimes, he said, without looking up. That night, for a few hours, my father appeared genuinely haunted, and I was heartened. He sat in his study, looking out the window for a while, and then he took out some files from the cabinets in there. He was flipping through my mother's notes and preliminary pages for her book on Paul and Jane Bowles. For all my father's achievements, my mother was always a step or two ahead of him. She was the one who'd finished the Sunday crossword puzzle, 
who knew word derivations, who could speak three languages, who had more persuasive things to say about the films and plays we went to. She feared alternately that I would pursue success single-mindedly like my father, or that I'd inherit her impractical intelligence, the kind that ensured the vibrancy of their social life, but that, it only recently, that only recently had earned her in the form of the bull's advance, even a modest income. When she was on her deathbed, I was still deciding who to be like and who to rebel against, though I still had time to fail them both. I watched him from the doorway. I felt a bit guilty for forcing him into my mood, but it was a mission I'd undertaken. Someone should follow up on this, he said. All this good work shouldn't go to waste. Maybe I will, I said. His eyes lit up. Oh, I'd love that. I really would. Then he gathered up the pages, put them away, and got dressed to go out. The radio station was on the fifth floor of an old warehouse building on the lower west side. I had to call from a payphone to get someone to open the padlocks on the back door and bring me up in a rusted elevator. I essentially produced for a phone-in issues show, the insurgency in Iraq, corruption in the Justice Department, screening callers, engaging people's on-air skills. Their politics didn't matter to me so long as they had something to say. The most intense conversation I had was with a man whose wife had Alzheimer's who'd called to talk about stem cell research. After 45 years of marriage, his wife barely recognized him, and once, after a meal, she tried to tip him. I listened to his stories, and then I told him about my mother. Nothing planned. He spoke, and then I did, back and forth, a game of catch. I told him about lying to everyone, making excuses for her thinness. That was her rule. She thought her publisher would cancel her contract if it got out she was sick. I told him about Thanksgiving, how I kept pushing her to eat. She said politely she didn't want any more, but I insisted. She couldn't hold it down. She covered her face and ran to the kitchen, my father and me hovering as she leaned over the sink. My God, I can't do this. I just can't do anything. She was so terribly sorry, she said, that she'd ruined our Thanksgiving. It was the last time we ate a meal together, and I screwed it up, I said. You're lucky. The caller had an even baritone and a slight Brooklyn accent. You're more than lucky she's dead and buried. Dead and alive is what's killing me. It's breaking my heart. Jonas met me at the Dublin House on 79th and Broadway later that night. It was packed and everyone was drinking as if the end of the world was coming. At least it felt that way to me. We settled down at a dark wood table in the back and made our way through two sizable pictures. I described how my father appeared to have a steady girlfriend now, a school administrator named Linda. Women do great on their own, he said, but the men from our father's generation are kind of clueless. For all their yelling at each other, my dad couldn't go three days without my mother. Remember when my Aunt Beth died? My Uncle Ned remarried within five months. The buzzing in my head started in again, and then the music got incredibly loud. Jonas was saying something about the way we're wired, which I couldn't really hear. Then it felt like someone had shoved cotton in my ears. I've gone deaf, I said. He helped me to my feet and pushed me through a maze of beery faces out the door. In the freezing air, my hearing returned. Is it possible you're working backwards through the healing process, he said off, I said. I'm not knocking it. I think it's admirable. I threw up on his shoes and felt somewhat better. <laughs> Over that weekend, Jonas took me to a Rites of Spring party on Spring Street, enduringly enough. We rode the subway down, then walked there through a late March blizzard. The cars moved soundlessly down the street. From somewhere in the heavens, a snowball scraped the top of Jonas's head. Took you f***ing long enough, a woman's voice yelled. She was leaning out the window of a fourth floor apartment. Took us forever to shovel out the driveway, Jonas yelled back. The party was packed with downtown hipsters, most about five years older than us, with something all ready to show for their lives. In what passed as a dining room, the snowball hurler, Sylvie, was arranging the hors d'oeuvres platters and mixing margaritas. You're Andrew, she said, when I walked by the food table. The crier, I thought. She handed me a margarita, then tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. She was nearly my height, pale and possibly sleep deprived, with an oval face, soft features, and dark librarian glasses. When we shook hands, hers was damp from the snow or from squeezing limes. After a minute or two of introductory conversation, she said, I'm really sorry about your mother. Thanks, I said. Someone called her name, and she excused herself and went to hug a woman in a short skirt and knee-high boots who introduced her, her to a white guy with thick dreadlocks. When she returned, she said, I don't know if Jonas told you, but I went through something similar when I was in high school. 
I was starting to understand that having someone close to you die meant hearing everyone else's saddest story. <laughs> you lost your mother, I said. Father, listen, you, you don't want to talk about this at a party. You probably don't want to talk about this at a party. Maybe not, I said. And so we talked about where she went to school and my job at the radio station. She was studying art history at Columbia. She told me all about her roommate, Dana, whom Jonas had slept with once. Zero chemistry, she said. And then she asked me how my father was coping. Sort of as an experiment, or because I had a buzz on, I decided to tell her the abridged saga of my winter about the perfume notes and late night calls, how I felt sometimes like a dormitory RA, how I'd bumped into t-shirted women in the kitchen half asleep, how one of them made elaborate snacks in the middle of the night, and how another, the boutique owner, accidentally walked naked into my room thinking it was my father's. <laughs> oh, please. You think she went in there by accident, Sylvia said? <laughs> I guess I did. Sweetheart, when my father died, my mother kept me away from the men she was dating. We were side by side and our arms brushed. My body tensed. I was 16 and I think she thought I'd try to seduce them. And I probably would have in my own insecure way, not literally, but enough to ruin things for her. In any event, she stayed over at their apartments. At first, it was only on the weekends, but then it was like four nights a week. She'd phone to tell me to order a pizza for me and my brother, or Chinese food, whatever we wanted, and to charge it to her American Express card. She poured me another margarita, then poured herself one. I could have stayed out in clubs all night, she said, or had huge ass parties, and she would never have known. I tried it once, throwing a party, but I ended up getting too nervous about all the people there getting drunk and throwing up, so I kicked them all out. Did she remarry? Yes, to my stepfather. Do you like him? Better than her, she said. Seriously? Let's just say he's a lot less complicated. I find everything about my father's dating depressing. I said, depressing is when he dates a 20-year-old. He hasn't done that yet, I said. Then count your blessings. I watched her after that. She was unabashed in a way that usually put me off, but in her there was something heartfelt that I latched onto. She disappeared for a half hour or so and then reappeared at my side. Feel like getting out of here, she said. You mean the two of us? You think you could do better, she said. I tilted my head in mock judgment. She was kind of gawky, I thought, with narrow hips and long skinny arms and an illegible word written on the back of her wrist. Her hair held the shape of a wool cap she must have worn to the party. But she didn't seem to care. All right, let's go, I said. It was Sylvie's idea to stop by our house. She wanted to meet my father, quote, in the flesh and see if he was as dashing as she imagined. When we reached home, Linda was camped out in the kitchen making a pot of coffee. Your dad went down to tell the doorman to turn up the heat, she said. She wore a cashmere v-neck sweater of my father's over a white camisole and looked like a late career Jane Fonda. It's freezing in here, don't you think? I'm Sylvie, Sylvie said. She took off her ski cap and shook out her hair, sprinkling melting snow into the room and onto her glasses, which she removed and placed in her coat pocket. And I'm Linda, Andrew's dad's girlfriend, Linda said. She pulled out three mugs, one that I hadn't seen before with the Statue of Liberty drinking coffee. She poured us cups and told us about her evening coaching a room of Bensonhurst kids about writing resumes. My father buzzed the intercom from downstairs and said he'd be up in 10 minutes. When he wants things done, he goes out and gets them done, Linda said, smiling. I could have told her that was inaccurate, that when my father wanted things done, he convinced others to do them for him. But I figured she'd learn that soon enough. <laughs> it's supposed to get down to single digits by morning, Linda said. Are you two in for the night? I pretended not to grasp what she was suggesting, but Sylvie said, no, we just came by to warm up. When my father came in and saw that I was with a young woman, he grinned widely. Welcome to spring, he said. He asked Sylvie a series of questions about herself, listened with interest to her answers, and then showed her the view. There was something both wistful and very tender in the way he treated us. We walked uptown along the park. I didn't know where we were headed, only that Sylvie appeared to have a plan. We sat on a, pen, a bench on the path at 81st Street and sipped from a pint bottle of Knob Creek we'd bought at a corner liquor store, assessing the few passers-by who'd braved the weather. A young guy two or three years older than me hobbled across on crutches. He's faking, Sylvie said. Grab one of his crutches. What would I do with just one? You could sell it back to him, she said, or you could beat him with it. We traveled then to the benches near the band shell where Sylvie said she used to roller skate. I used to ride my skateboard over to watch people like her, I said. I was the one in the hot pants, she said. Really? I think I kissed you once. We were at the corner of Central Park in the middle of the night, I thought. And I thought, this is what unbalanced people do. 
Snow dropped down on us. My feet felt cold and wet, and I took another slug of whiskey. I was getting drunk. She rested her legs over mine, and I warmed them with my hands. That all felt forced, and then it didn't. As though she'd been working up to the question, she asked me, what's the weirdest thing you can do with your body? I don't understand, I said. I mean, can you do this? She touched her elbows behind her head. Or this? She bent her hand back so that her fingertips touched the back of her forearm. No, I said, nor would I want to. She looked so distraught that I went ahead and wiggled my left ear, something I hadn't done since grade school. I knew there was greatness in you, she said. <laughs> At some point, because it was on my mind, I told her about walking in the park with my mother a week after we'd found out she was sick. I'd been away for the summer and I'd flown back to the city the day before. My mother was critiquing my wardrobe, the holes in my t-shirts and jeans. I'm buying you some pants, she said. Don't be embarrassed. I won't, I said. We went to some stores on Columbus Avenue and I felt like I was 11. She bought me four pairs of pants, two pairs of dress socks, three shirts, and a navy pea coat. It was as though she were outfitting me for a trip. It was the first time I understood there were a finite number of afternoons we'd have together, 100, 99. The next day, it would be 98. We never talked about the fact that she was dying or what she was heading into. I think we both believed there'd be time, but it all went so quickly. The night I came to her with all the questions and thoughts I'd been saving up, her painkillers had made her so dopey she thought I was taking her to the opera. I actually played Carmen for her, and she said, head pressed into her pillow, that it was unbearably beautiful. She knew that she was sick and in bed, but she thought she was young and in bed with the flu. And she asked me on one of her last days if I could make sure her tennis racket was strung because she'd broken a string the summer before. I took it into a shop, and when they'd finished, I brought it back to show her. When I reached her, the nurse had upped her morphine, and from then on, she was gone. When my story ended, Sylvie closed her eyes. You know, I said everything I wanted to say to my father. And he made his peace with me. But I never played opera for him while he was in bed. She said, that is such a f cool thing to do. Outside her building, Sylvie declared, it's been a while since I slept with anyone. I just smiled stupidly. You're quite adorable, she said. Her roommate was away for the weekend. It was a pretty standard grad school apartment, two tiny bedrooms, a kitchenette, a narrow hallway, and a sunken living room decorated with a nice plush armchair and couch that must have come, on, come from someone's family. We passed out in our clothes for an hour or two, and we slept together with them off. Undressed, she was far sexier than her boyish clothes and awkward eagerness had forecast, and when she pulled me inside her, I felt irrationally as though I might have fallen in love. At around 4 a.m., I woke up sweating and startled from a nightmare. My mother wasn't in this one. My father had died, and I was sorting through his papers and clothes, and I was showing our apartment to a series of realtors. I asked them each, have you seen the view over Central Park? It took some effort to determine that my father was snoring in his bed a dozen blocks away, and my relief at this understanding was so overwhelming, I wept uncontrollably. In the morning, I was curious to find myself in a strange apartment and not in my childhood room. I heard car horns and voices outside, a doorman's whistle. I felt tired still, but in a different way, as though I'd been drugged. I noticed then what wasn't there, the buzzing. I stumbled over to the clock on her desk, 9.34. You can go if you want, she said from the bed. What do you mean? I mean, I sort of trapped you here last night, she said. There was something fragile in her eyes I hadn't yet seen. I'd much rather stay, I said. She smiled and curled into her pillow. Her feet dangled from beneath the covers. I slipped back into bed and drew her to me so that her warm back rested against my chest. I closed my eyes, and in seconds, I was out. I slept as I hadn't in years through that whole snowy day, and when I awoke again, it was night. I threw on my pants and padded down the hallway where I came across her reading a book on the living room sofa, legs curled beneath her. She glanced up at me. It stopped snowing, she said. Shall we go get a bite? Yes, I said. I grabbed the rest of my clothes from the bedroom. We bundled up and headed into the freezing night. On Broadway, I felt the wind rip through my peacoat all the way to my skin, and I was aware then that I had left the first stage of my life and was out in the world in a way I was never before. Thanks.
So, um, yeah, I'd love to talk about whatever you guys, you know, want to talk about. So, um, I write a lot of New York stories. There's a, there's a bunch of New York City stories and some uh, and some upstate New York stories. And the novel's set in New York, and the nonfiction book is set in New York. So I think eventually I'll write about California, but it hasn't happened yet. That's a really good question. I think there's a, there's a much more natural affinity between the two groups and the two groups recognized. And I think two things go on. I think that uh, journalists are sometimes intimidated by people who write literary fiction. And, and there's, maybe there's a little bit of intimidation the other way. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. But, um, but I always, when I teach, I tell my students, it's kind of an old-fashioned term, but I say that I want them to be men and women of letters. And, it's so, and I found that for me, um, as a nonfiction writer, you know, and the first job I had was, was to be a newspaper reporter in upstate New York. And someone said, well, how did that turn you into a fiction writer? And said, well, my job was to go out in the world and listen to people and to find stories, which are two things you need you know, as a writer. I also had to generate a lot of copy. I had to write quickly. And I lost a little bit of that obsessive self-consciousness that you can get. You know, it's because I just had to turn things out and publish it. And, and I learned how to write clean sentences that way. But I've always liked, yeah, I think it's a really good relationship. I think the, the, non, the, the Night Fellows were out in the world in a way that was really exciting to me. You know, I liked, I liked uh, that, that. And they, I, think they're, they, I, I think the Night Fellows who went and took our classes, the fiction classes, went back to their, their nonfiction and they were better at it. Yeah, we had this guy, Mike Stanton, who, uh, who wrote this Buddy Cianci book, you know, and he, he'd won a Pulitzer, I think, before, he, he, but he was in my class, but he, um, he, he, he was a really good fiction writer, too. And you could see it when he went back, and he really got better in the course of, of being there, so. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you something. I had just finished uh, The Last Good Chance. I finished my first novel, and then I was thrown into, this, into the midst of the aftermath of Cantor Fitzgerald a week after that had happened. And I felt, I mean, I felt I lost a lot of friends. I felt a lot of things. But one of the felt I, as a writer is that I'd been dropped at like page 190 of a novel. Like I could see, I could already see the different storylines. And I, and I had a sense of how to tell the story from, from, my, from that background that I couldn't have if I had just been a journalist and not had the, the experience of writing a novel. I had just, my, The Last Good Chance has a lot of different storylines. And, you know, and, and there are a lot of things that I learned in the process of that that I could take immediately into my next, into a nonfiction project. And so, yeah, I, I, I feel like there's a big connection. I'm glad, I, and I still want to do both. Yeah, I don't, I don't just want to write fiction. So I, I did this crazy piece about the Shah of Iran's exile recently that was in McSweeney's. It was a blast. Yeah. Thank you, story. Thank you so much. You did an amazing job reading. Thank you. And, um, like well, in the, you know, it's gone through a lot of drafts, and so I think that what you, you end up trying to clear out so much stuff. So, and, and the more, you know, the, the, the thing about, there's a line from Crossing to the Safety where Wallace Stegner is, the, it's, the, it, it's really about him as a writer, and he's with someone at a party, and they're asking how the writing is going, and he said it's just absolute torture, and the person has a big smile on his face. He's like, I think I can't wait to read what you're writing, because like torturous writing leads to really graceful reading, you know, in a, I, don't, I don't remember what it was, but the idea is if, if that through the draft process is often where you make it seem really easy, you know, in a way, which is because it's, it's, it's all that stuff that you remove, you know, out of that. But thank you. That, that, yeah. Did you know the storyline prior to writing it? Well, it was different evolutions, like, and, and in fact, I mean, I can, it, it just started with the sort of, I, I actually, my, my mom died and I had the experience of going to a party a week afterwards and watching these women surround my family. And he, my father did start sleeping with these different women. I mean, that, that aspect was happening to me. And then in the original draft, I had the character of Sylvie and she was too much, she was too perfect. Like, a, like she's just, it just seemed like she was like the award that came to him at the end. And she had to be, she had to have her own story and strangeness, you know, and to make that kind of connection and, and to make it seem like not obvious that he was, he would, you know, and um, that he had to be, he had to connect to her in a, in a sort of very particular way. And um, so that was one of the things I learned in the process. And then, I mean, I had a sense of, it, it's difficult of trying to convey the father while he's doing something that, that's driving the kid crazy, that, that to still convey that the father loved the mother and is, a, is essentially a good man, you know, without, while he's doing this stuff that, that's not so great. Yeah, so that was a challenge to do, but um, yeah.
those were those were some of the things. But it went through a lot of a lot of drafts. So, but that was that was the fun of it. I think you know. I mean, ultimately, it's really that's what you know. The people that write stories, you got to fall in love with the draft process. It's um, and my line about stories is that until they're perfect, and what I mean by perfect isn't it's the greatest story in the world. It means that you're not going to budge on a line. But until they're perfect, they suck. So they're not like almost, like a novel that's, that's just short of perfect can be really good. And a story that's just short of it isn't, isn't anything until it's right, until, I mean, Vikram, don't you? Yeah, so. She was, she actually was a woman. She wasn't, and, and I, we met her on vacation and, and, and um, there was a woman and the creepy thing for me you know, I made up a lot of stuff, like the whole scene of her dancing, that's all from my imagination, but I did meet her, this woman. We, we went to Mexico, and it wasn't clear to me whether she was into my dad or me. My dad went to the bathroom, and she was clearly into me, in a way, and I found that so nauseating, I guess, at that, at that particular point. It was just like, like, I could go either way, dad, you know, it's just, so, and then I just, I guess I just, I took her and, and brought her to New York, you know, for that scene, so. I think she actually did come to New York once. I wasn't around, but um, this was like, like I, at some point, I can't remember what happened, but she like got stoned with my father, which is, if you know my father, is so preposterous, you know, like, in, <laughs> but, yeah, but some, some are made up, yeah. I mean, the, the first woman in it, you know, they're, 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 so, and some are composites, yeah. You know, it depends on the story, you know, and a couple of these stories, um, uh, I had this bizarrely wonderful experience. I went to a, a place called the Yaddo Colony in Saratoga Springs, and I was feeling it. And I wrote four of the stories in this collection while I was there. And I wrote like eight other stories that I thought were equally good. And I came back, I found out they weren't, you know. But, um, and those, some of those, like Balloon Night, I really wrote in one sitting, you know, and, and I just tweaked it a little bit. But uh, this story went through a lot of drafts, the, the, the title story, and when I say a lot, it can span years, you know, and basically what happens is you reach a point where it's not working, you don't know why, and you just have to put it aside. And then it's really weird because you'll be working on something else or reading something and suddenly you're like, and you're not even thinking about that story, but you're like, I know what I have to do with that story. And it will seem so obvious to you. And um, I mean, a number of them, there's that. There's a few stories where I always teach, I, are, you, are there a lot of writers in the room? I don't know, maybe, yeah, good. Well, anyway, like, so one of the things that I always, that, that, that's helpful for workshops and helpful for me to thinking about endings is that the ending is usually contained somewhere earlier in the story. And so, like I have the story Howling at the Moon, and it was a similar problem to the end of the women. I had this moment where this, this son and mother have really been uh, having issues. The mother's been blaming the son for something. And, and I had this moment at the end where they kind of connect and everything's happily, you know, they go off happily ever after. And the people I remember in workshops said, uh-uh. You know, and they showed me why that couldn't possibly happen based on other things earlier in the story. And I rejected that and they said, no, you're wrong. And then I sat with it for a little while and realized they were right, you know, and, it, and, and the ending now works. So there's a few things like that, you know, that's just, I guess you, you know it's not right. There's another story where I had a scene with a character who comes out of nowhere and I realized the scene had to be with, with a different character, like the same dialogue. And it was so obvious and the story instantly worked. It didn't, it's the story January. It's another story in there, and I, and I had a scene with an with a older brother who was nowhere earlier in the story, and instead it's, it's this, the mother's boyfriend where he goes to a diner with, and, and it worked. Like, but I couldn't see it for years, and I was sending it out. You know, and the nice thing is, it, it got, I'm so happy it got rejected from these different places. And then I, 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 I fixed it, and then it, the first place I sent it out to, it got taken. So I usually think it's good news. If, if your, your stories are getting rejected, you can think it's just a conspiracy against you. But there's, if, it, if it's rejected everywhere, it's, there's probably an issue with it. It's probably a good thing that it's getting rejected. You don't want stuff that's not, you know, it, it's, I have a few stories that were published that didn't make it in the collection, and they're, they're problematic. You know, I don't, I don't want them. I don't want you to read them, you know, so, but. Yeah, I think as soon as you throw a couple things that are different in there, you change a couple things. Maybe you change the occupation of a character. You change you change something physically about the character. You know, a couple details in there. Then I think what you want to do is you want to keep 
Um, I mean, there's, there's this adage that always sounds to non-writers like it's crap, you know, where people say that fiction is truer than, than non-fiction. And I think what it is is you're going at some, some like what you're drawing from is, is, is uh, emotional and psychological truth, and then you can change the external. Like don't, the, the, the thing to do is, is to be true to that, the, the memory of that, and not be true to all the individual details. My dad actually was writing his memoirs. Um, this was like before he died, um, and he was in the Navy, and he was saying like our ship was either 35 miles or 40 miles. Like he was worried that someone would, you know, I'd say, Dad, no one cares, just pick one or the other. You know, just go for it, 35 miles, I'll do it, you know, and just, um, but it, yeah, you, you, can, you can change things like that, and then it'll make you feel a little bit freer, I think, so. Yes, but and here's where I, my publisher will be very happy with me. You can buy the book, you know, and so, what, no, and what I mean by that is, um, you hear the story, you read it, what I do is, I think, I think what you just did is exactly the right way if you're first encountering a story that you should do. You should not be thinking about technique and you should, and the, the, the best compliment you can give a writer is that you dropped into the dream of it, that you didn't, if you're not aware constantly as you're listening that a writer has written it, that's the best thing you can do. And what I do is I try to give that for my students and, and the work, you know, when I'm reading it, is drop into the dream of it and then I go back and read it, you know, many, many times over. Cause, and then I try to think of what it's doing to me and then I try to figure out how and why, and then I try to mimic it, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, if, if you have to learn how to write a section of summary, you have to learn how to, you know, introduce characters, you know, how to move in time, you know, if there's a good flashback, look and see how that's used, you know, all that, that type of stuff you can study. And I always, I say that no one taught me in grad school, I did most, I mean, they did, I went to great grad schools, but they weren't teaching craft, and most of the craft you get from, uh, you know, reading it like stories like five, six times, you know, more than that. When I teach, there's some stories, you too probably, that you've read like 10 times, you know, and you're still finding stuff in it. So, yeah, so I think it's, it's multiple readings and reading for what you can steal, you know, what, what you can grab. I had a friend call me up and tell me he was gonna steal something from me. You know, it was like something, and he, and he, and he it was from like the first story of the break, and he had a scene that, he was, that was gonna be very similar. And I said, go for it, you know, and it was, it was unre I, I was flattered that he, he thought that he was stealing from me. It was so good. I thought it was better than what I'd written, so it was great. No one minds, you know, if you do that, so. Um, you had another question? Yeah. Do you write every day? Oh, uh, no. Um, I mean, I, I'd like to think that I do. I need, I, I mean, I, I have a seven-year-old and I have, and I teach and stuff, but I try, now I have to, I have a book that's due and I'm, I'm gonna try to write, you know, I'll, I'll probably take a day off a week, but I'll try to do six days a week, I think. And, um, but my, now I've, I've gotten to the point where, you know, with all the responsibilities that I have, that the best thing I can do is every once in a while, I will leave my life for two weeks uh, and I have friends who will lend me houses you know, in far off places, and I just, I don't see anybody, and I just, and what I like about that is that I can write for a long time, and then I can just sit and take a walk and think about it, and then I can cook a meal and come back to it, you know, and just scribble notes. And I, I think you, when you, the responsibilities of life, you can get your writing time in, but all that dreamy time in which, in which the, the, the book is taking shape, I think you need some of that too. And that's, you know, I think it, it uh, that's great, and I, and I try to figure out a way to, to get that. I always tell my students, don't schedule something right after you finish writing, because when you finish writing, you, you work for your three hours, and then there's this phenomenon, it's a little bit like when you took a test in high school, and the second the test was over, you figured out the four things you should have put in the test. Well, you'd get that when you write, but the good news, if you have a notebook with you and you take a walk, is that all those things that you should have put into your writing you can put into your writing. You can just write them down and come back after your walk. And, and, I, and, I, and you don't get those if you immediately schedule something social, you know, right afterwards or something, so. So are you like one of those writing I, You have to schedule it. I mean, you have to put in your hours in, but then there are other times of the day. You're kind of always, when you're in the middle of a project, you're always writing, and you're always, like, you're at a party and someone says something and you'll go grab your notebook and write it down, and the world starts to feed you. It's nice, that's, I mean, that's, that's the best way is when you're in the middle of something. It's, there's my boy. <laughs> I think that's it. <laughs> he is, James. You want to ask a question, James? <laughs> well, maybe one more question. Any last questions? Right yeah, where? Right here. Oh, great. Can you, can you hit us with maybe your top five stories of all time? Wow. Whoa. Wow. That's really great. Um, three, three. No, I'll, 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 I'll see if I can do it. I mean, I, um, 
The Country Husband by John Cheever. I love. Um, yeah, yeah, I am, James. Um, I just taught Lady with the Pet Dog, which I've taught a ton, the Chekhov story, and maybe because I've read it a million times. Um, wow. Um, I love a George Saunders story called Winky. Um, I love almost anything in Pastoralia. Um, let's think. Oh, and Alice Munro, three stories from Runaway, uh, Chance, Soon, and Silence. I read them sitting on an airplane. I read them back to back to back. They're all in the same issue of The New Yorker, and it was one of the most intense experiences I ever had. It's just, they're so, so good. So those are some off the top of my head. So, but good question. I'll make a list. If you can give me your email or something, and I'll, I'll give you a longer list. So, um, but such a pleasure. Thank you. James, you have a question for me? No, no? OK. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>